Beneath the waves of the ocean, there's a world that to our ears and our imagination seems a great realm of silence. But nothing could be further from the truth. The ocean can be as noisy as a city street. What if you could break through all that maddening din? What if you could break through all that sound and pick out a single car, a single conversation, but exactly. or a single enemy submarine swimming thousands of miles away? Over the last hundred years, the nations of the world fought for global dominance beneath the sea. The Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States epitomized that global conflict. Each knew from the very beginning that ultimate victory lay beneath the sea, and it was a complex game of cat and mouse, of silence and surveillance. But in the final analysis, it was simple. You needed to know every move your enemy made. This is the story about underwater sound, how it is made, but especially how it is heard. It is also about one of the most sophisticated and secret listening devices the world has ever known, one the United States and its allies used to win the Cold War. I was a part of this world, a commander in the U.S. Navy Submarine Corps, the Silent Service. There are secrets I know from the Cold War I may never be able to tell, but some are now being revealed. One is called SOSIS for Sound Surveillance System, something so hidden that its name was declassified only in 1991. Even now, it is still shrouded in secrecy. The ocean's filled with all sorts of sound. In some sense, it's a cacophony of things going on. The Navy's SOSA system allowed you to make detections at just absolutely astounding ranges uh, using passive, very low frequency acoustics. Even before satellites spied from above the Earth, the United States was listening from below the waves. At one point, 30,000 miles of telephone cable lay in strings across the world's seabeds, each with sophisticated listening devices attached to them. The U.S. and its allies had literally wired the oceans for sound. In the Cold War, Sosis could hear the motor of the periscope on a Soviet submarine from thousands of miles away. I thought it was almost impossible. And if the United States did it, it does mean that their technological level is uh, fantastic. Like put an American on the moon. It was a time when we had a clear enemy, the Soviet Union. It was a time when the Cold War raged. And it was a time of paranoia. Since 1948, the Soviets have been carrying on a vicious propaganda attack on every phase of US life. When all sides feared what they didn't know and magnified the threats of what they did know. Behind the smiles hidden from public view, superpower military engagements took place almost exclusively underwater. Submarines were Cold War weapons of choice. Most of the time we had the upper hand. Our subs were silent. Theirs could be heard. Some of the earlier Soviet submarines, their propeller blades would vibrate. Imagine a very large bicycle wheel with a very large ace of spades playing card stuck in the, in the spokes. That's what it would sound like. I call it a flutter. And it was unmistakable when you heard it. So long as they stayed at certain levels of, of noisiness, we could, we can in effect detect them across the vast reaches of the ocean. What we didn't know was that we were also being betrayed sold out by those we trusted, 
Suddenly, the enemy knew we were listening. And what the U.S. had feared came true. The enemy, too, began to master the art of silence. Born from the betrayals, a submarine strong, fast, and silent. It is a Kula. In Russian, it means shark. The Kula was the first Soviet submarine, and actually, to this date, the only one in some ways uh, that was designed from the ground up to be as quiet as possible across the whole spectrum of ways in which you could be loud. Its signature existed, but had been reduced to such a level that Sosis couldn't detect it anymore. The most diabolical sub we ever faced disappeared into the depths of the ocean. And Sosis, the world's largest and most sophisticated underwater surveillance system, lying at the bottom of the ocean, had been rendered ineffective. And we were left wondering, how had this happened? It's one of the world's most sophisticated machines, and yet it can be betrayed by the simplest sound. Silence is key to its survival in the world's biggest echo chamber, the ocean. There's a pretty good echo in here, and that's because it's a big room, and there's no soft furnishings in here at all. You've got bare walls, bare ceiling, bare everything. And in a way, it's a lot like this under the sea, if you imagine this filled with water. Then we'd have the sea surface above us, which is a very good reflector of sound. The seabed below us reflecting sound as well, so you've got echoes everywhere. It has been said that a noise annoys. It is any unwanted sound. To understand the problem of noise and the answers to it, we must know something of the nature, transmission, and sources of noise aboard a submarine. The submarine hull has the potential to be a big noise transmitter. We had a weightlifting enthusiast in one of my submarines, HMS Churchill. One day, he dropped a dumbbell. Bang! You could almost feel it. From there, the vibration, the noise, is conducted to the hull and radiated from the hull into the water. I can just see this noise wanging its way all over the oceans and, um, and some potential adversary sitting there saying, hello, hello, we've, we've got company. In World War II, submarines dived underwater, usually just to attack and sonar technology was rudimentary. Silence really just was not the point. Not in the Cold War. Nuclear subs like this stayed underwater for months, hunting Soviet submarines. Stealth was everything, and that meant knowing the science of underwater sound. 550 years ago, inventor Leonardo da Vinci, sailing in the Mediterranean, would stick a long hollow tube into the water and listen to passing ships miles away. And in 1822, Swiss physicist Daniel Colladin conducted an experiment that for the first time measured the speed of sound underwater. He built this apparatus, uh, which basically hammered an underwater bell but the hammer also fired a charge of gunpowder in air. And he had another boat several miles away. And the observer on the other boat would observe the flash of gunpowder and would also uh, listen for the sound, the underwater signal from the bell by the old Leonardo listening tube technique. And he would time the difference between the two. The underwater signal is quicker. It's about uh, five times as fast as the in-air signal. So if sound travels so well underwater, why does intuition tell us that the ocean is a realm of solitude? The answer is that human hearing is limited, and the ocean is full of low-frequency sound that we cannot detect. When a recording of a whale song is played, we change its frequency so we can hear it. Whales communicate at extremely low frequencies, too low for our ears. It's the key to their survival, and they do it at vast distances. The high-frequency sound we can hear underwater gets weakened and absorbed by the ocean. Low-frequency sound is stronger. 
whether coming from a whale or an enemy sub's propellers, and low frequency sound travels best anywhere. In the air, on land, and especially in the water. Meet Maurice Ewing. Long before the Cold War ever started, he discovered something that would change its course dramatically. Ewing was a geophysicist studying the Earth below the seabed. To do this, he went to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and used their research vessel, Atlantis. Studying the seismology of the ocean floor, his work would include throwing explosive charges into the water. While the charges were going overboard, they would go off and the sound would hit the bottom and bounce back up again and they would record their data. He actually calculated that the sound had traveled roughly 25 miles up and down. If that component of the ocean existed in a horizontal plane, you could project sound or detect sounds from thousands of miles away. So in 1937, he composed an hypothesis. Is there a horizontal layer in the ocean that would transmit sound over thousands of miles? And Doc was right, 4,000 feet down in the Atlantic Ocean. He discovered the, what he called the deep sound channel. Water pressure and temperature create the channel. And once a sound is caught inside, it will travel uninterrupted for thousands of miles. Think of this stone hitting the water as if it were a sound generated by a submarine beneath the sea. You see it propagates outward in a radial pattern, and it's not the water moving that you see, it's the energy moving through the water that you see in the form of a wave. As the stone hits the water, it's radiating outward in all directions. Here, it's only in two dimensions, but beneath the sea, it's radiating out like a sphere of disturbance, a sphere of noise, a sphere of energy that's going up in all directions, and that's how that sound enters the sound channel. At this underwater research station in Bermuda, scientists later conducted a unique underwater experiment. On the other side of the planet, in Australia, colleagues dropped charges into the ocean. The hypothesis? To see if we could record signals over a 12,000 mile ocean path. This is the recording at Bermuda of the signals from three 50 pound charges dropped off Perth, Australia, 12,000 miles away. Goes through the Indian Ocean, the South Atlantic, then the North Atlantic. Three hours later, we recorded at Bermuda. Just imagine, the ocean and everything in it was there for us to listen to, but few recognized the potential of this naturally occurring ocean phenomenon at first. Ewing proposed using it as a way to locate a down pilot. You would physically throw the charge into the water. It would go off at or near the deep sound channel. When the detonation took place, shore stations attached to submerged geophones or hydrophones would hear the signal, and if you had three of them in place, you could triangulate on the sound, and you'd know precisely where in the ocean your pilot was. If I were a pilot, and I had a choice between taking a first aid kit and some food, or some charges out of the plane with me, I'd take the charges and leave the food behind. Because once out in the water, it would take those charges no time at all to drop down to 4,000 feet, and there would be a rescue within only a couple of hours maximum, probably sooner. And then I could go and have a steak dinner. I wouldn't need the rations. The deep sound channel was never used to rescue down pilots. The United States and its allies, though, would soon realize that it could be used for a much greater mission, to listen to Cold War enemy threats lurking in the oceans. It would change the course of history. The submarines of World War II, their job, attack ships anytime, anywhere. They were simple machines, boats that could go underwater. Until this, the Type 21, Nazi Germany's ultimate undersea weapon, a diesel submarine that dove deeper and stayed underwater longer than any boat before it. 
It came out near the end of World War II, too late to do much damage to the Allies. But as the U.S. traded one enemy for another, it feared the Soviets would learn from Germany. Well, the Soviet Union, as with the West, you know, goes into Germany and expropriating all this German technology and bringing it back home. And, and the fear was that the Soviet Union would pound out uh, Type 21 type submarines in the hundreds. That made submarine warfare a primary purpose of the United States Navy in the post-1945 era. It also made a potential Soviet submarine threat a high priority. After World War II, the United States experienced peace and prosperity. What Sun worshippers never knew was that the enemy subs would soon lurk just off their beaches. What they also didn't know was that in the same waters, the U.S. Navy was building something to protect them. It was just off the island of Bermuda that Maurice Ewing discovered that sound could travel thousands of miles underwater. Now this acoustic pathway, it's actually a layer at a depth of about 1,000 meters or 3,000 feet here in the Atlantic Ocean. Ewing called it the sound channel. Now when his sponsors, the Navy, heard about this discovery, they had an idea. What if you took advantage of this physics of the ocean by taking listening devices and going all the way around the perimeter of an ocean basin and placing them at 3,000 feet? With that listening system, you could then track any object in the ocean basin making sound, like a nuclear submarine. This made it possible for them to basically set up a burglar alarm system in an ocean basin. Or by another name, Sound Surveillance System, SOSIS. The Sound Surveillance System uses passive listening devices, hydrophones suspended in the ocean in the deep sound channel in the Atlantic, about 3,000 feet. A sound in the ocean is made. It enters the deep sound channel. The hydrophones pick it up, turning it into electrical signals. Those signals go to a shore station to be analyzed. The eventual goal was to have a set of arrays running down the American East Coast and running down the American West Coast as an early warning system for possible Soviet submarine threats approaching the American coast. What few people knew at the time is that the British had already used the concept of underwater listening to detect submarines. It had been in World War I. Hydrophones were placed in the shallows surrounding England. Hearing the passing U-boat, the guy on shore listening in would signal battleships to open fire. Four German U-boats were, were sunk as a direct result of um, the hydrophone actions. While British hydrophones conquered the shallows, Sosis would conquer the deep. Hearing a single noise thousands of miles away, Sosis was like a giant wiretap, listening in on an unsuspecting enemy. If you're a human, you've got the directional response of your ears to help you. You can look around and pick out particular sounds. If you're an engineer, you've got to resort to something more like this. This is a directional microphone. I get a strong response if I point it straight at me, but I can point it around and pick out other sound sources, like a bus over there, or a boat, or a train up there. And the use of directional receivers like this is very important in sonar systems, and particularly in SOSIS because they're one of the, the key features that enables you to sort out man-made objects from natural background. The U.S. built its first SOSIS listening post in the Bahamas, and then it grew. What became a $16 billion underwater burglar alarm spreading up both U.S. coasts remained top secret. It would be years before it caught a Soviet submarine, but it did hear plenty of U.S. submarines January 21st, 1954, the U.S. launches Nautilus, the world's first nuclear sub. It is powerful. It is able to stay underwater for weeks at a time. It is revolutionary, but it is also extremely noisy. The acoustic signature of Nautilus was like the acoustic signature of all new submarines of this kind, very, very heavy on what we call propeller blade rate. 
very, very heavy on machinery sounds and machinery noise because the machinery wasn't properly balanced. We were surprised that there was a tremendous low frequency vibration coming from the Nautilus. Nautilus was loud. Nautilus was in a way famous among the SOSIS operators because she was so easy to detect, which of course the Navy found profoundly disturbing. She gave a good example of what the threat might be at its maximum at that point in time. If the Soviets had a relatively streamlined submarine that could do deep water work, and potentially if they could bring nuclear power to it, which was the ultimate threat at that time, of course, could SOSA detect it? And the answer was yes, they could. Nautilus and its loud noise changed the US Navy. If we could hear it, we had to assume the Soviets could hear it. You have this all-encompassing drive to basically eliminate all noise getting from inside the submarine through the hull out into the water. Take every single piece of rotating machinery in the submarine, design it to incredibly fine tolerances so there are no vibrations insulated from the hulls. It was up to this secret facility outside of Washington, D.C. to make those changes. While in the Navy, I'd always heard about the David Taylor model basin, but never saw it firsthand. Even today, what goes on here is a closely held secret. Cameras are rarely allowed inside. For the past 60 years, some of the world's greatest scientists have worked here. Today, they use sophisticated models and lasers to make submarines go faster, go deeper, and to go quieter. Silence is critical. A submariner wants to be quiet. It's part of the game they play with one another, and it's a very dangerous game. They realize that the person who hears you is the person who's probably going to kill you. While the Soviet Union was busy in the 1950s making its subs more powerful, researchers here focused on anything that made noise. This water tunnel was designed specifically to study propellers. Sosis told researchers that one of the loudest parts of the submarine was its propeller. When the blades slice through water, they kick up millions of bubbles every second and then pop them. It's called cavitation. Cavitation, when it occurs, is just an over overwhelming signal. It dominates all the others. If you think in terms of that packing material, sometimes you find in boxes where it's all those little bubbles. Um, bubbles form on the tips of the propeller blades and then pop in the water. You get this kind of hissing sound, which becomes a fantastic signature to pick up at long range. Seven years after Nautilus, another launch takes place. The result of the U.S. Navy's drive for submarine silence, the USS Thresher. But there's a small problem. Its propeller still makes noise. Thresher was designed to be totally quiet. Thresher goes to sea. Sosa's, meanwhile, been experimenting with lower and lower frequencies, and Sosa discovers there's this thing that we hadn't really anticipated that Thresher's still putting into the water and that still allows you to detect her. The new propellers were designed for Thresher uh, and for succeeding submarines. Other measures were taken. The results of the test made the Navy change the shape of the submarine's propellers. What was done is still kept secret, but what we can say is that the blades of the propellers are pulled back. Thresher thereafter is silent to Sosis. But there's a tragic irony to be played out. Three years after being launched, Thresher is lost at sea. An accident, probably mechanical failure, is the cause. Sosis stations hear the sound of the implosion of her hull. Across the ocean, in June of 1962, a different submarine swims near Iceland. Our new burglar alarm, Sosis, hears it. We detected a Soviet nuclear-powered submarine transiting the Greenland-Iceland-United Kingdom gap. That detection was made by the Sosa station in Barbados. It detected the Soviet nuclear submarine across the entire Atlantic Ocean, thousands of miles away. That clearly demonstrated that in the future, SOSIS would have an important role to play in the defense of the United States. That important role would, in fact, be understood sooner than they expected. 
October 1, 1962, four Soviet diesel submarines called Foxtrots head out from the Russian port city of Murmansk into the Barents Sea. U.S. intelligence officers assign them identifying numbers, C-18, C-19, C-20, and C-23. Their orders are clear. From the Barents, they steal into the North Atlantic, through the gap between Iceland and Britain, and then down east of Bermuda, between the Bahamas and to the port of Mariel in Cuba. They are sailing straight into the Cuban Missile Crisis. Rewind, January 1959. A socialist revolution brings Fidel Castro to power in Cuba and an ally of the Soviet Union just 90 miles off the coast of the United States. Over the next three years, hostilities between the U.S. and the Soviet Union escalate dangerously. This is one of the darkest periods of the Cold War. The vacant seat of Cuba, grimly significant as Secretary of State Dean Rusk, says the new Soviet intervention means a further enslavement of the Cuban people by Soviet power. All is leading up to October 1962, when the U.S. and the Soviet Union face off and bring the world to the brink of nuclear war. Probably from the point of view of nuclear war, it was the most uh, dangerous uh, episode in the Soviet-American Cold War confrontation. October 14, 1962. Spy plane photographs reveal a Soviet missile base in Cuba. More than 20 Soviet bloc ships, some carrying nuclear warheads from the Black Sea, are also seen. But invisible from the air are the four Foxtrot subs on their way from the Bering Sea. Their mission was to proceed undetected to the port of Mariel, which was a Cuban naval base and being developed by the Soviets at the time. The Foxtrots are direct descendants of the German Type 21. They can go fast, they can go deep, and each carries with it a dangerous payload. Every submarine had two nuclear armed, nuclear warhead torpedoes. So theoretically, such a submarine could uh, annihilate uh, an aircraft carrier of the United States without a difficulty. But with diesel engines, they must surface for power and air. They were noisy, and they didn't suspect we were listening. Pumps that were running, fans for the air supply, the shafts themselves are, are rotating. They did not have a good understanding of how uh, how far that noise could propagate. They don't seem to have understood at the time they, they embraced those designs that stealth, quietness, the ability to operate outside of that ubiquitous sensor was critical. They played right into the system we were building. I'm walking near a steel lattice bridge it's just like the steel hull of a Soviet Foxtrot submarine. As the train passes over the bridge, its engines are vibrating the bridge, radiating sound out into the air around us. That's the same thing that happens when a Soviet submarine passes through the water. Its diesel engine vibrates the hull, radiating sound out into the water around us. That's the same sound that the U.S. SOSA system detected in October 1962. In October of 1962, SOSIS is brand new. It's almost right off, the, right off the assembly line, and the Cuban Missile Crisis occurs right over the arrays. October 22nd, President Kennedy announces that the U.S. will set up a naval blockade of Cuba to prevent Soviet surface ships carrying nuclear warheads from getting to that island nation. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to haul and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and to stable relations between our two nations. On the same day, Kennedy is told by the CIA that the Soviet subs will reach Cuba within a week. 
hundreds of ships out there, carrier groups, uh, with all their destroyers and all of their carrier-based anti-submarine aircraft. The Soviets chose the worst possible place in the world to try and penetrate the greatest concentration of anti-submarine forces since World War II. It becomes a case study in anti-submarine warfare. Whatever the Navy can send out to find submarines, it does. And there is the Sosa system lying at the ocean's bottom. They provided coverage in an arc covering the approaches to the Caribbean and the North American continent. It acted as a burglar alarm, but even more so, it, it acted as something that told you what room the house the burglar was in. And then what you would do is, um, is just basically track it continuously. In the seven days after the blockade is announced, three of the four Soviet foxtrots will be identified and forced to the surface. October 24th, the quarantine line is up and running. In the afternoon of that day, patrol aircraft sights the snorkel of C-18 south of Bermuda. Naval historian Gary Weir interviewed the captain of the C-18, Nikolai Shumkov. At the time, the former Soviet commander did not know about the U.S.'s underwater sound surveillance system. He did, however, remember quite clearly a anti-submarine warfare plane being dispatched from the Norfolk area. They picked it up on their radio. They sent the plane to Shumkov's coordinates. At the time, he remembers being quite confused because the coordinates were disturbingly accurate. Shumkov just looked at me, and he shook his head, and he said, Sosis. Historic records are not clear if Sosis actually did find C-18. But on October 27th, this sub and another C-19 are forced to the surface by U.S. forces. It is Wednesday, October 31st, and SOSIS proves its worth. C-20 moves into the listening zone of the SOSIS station on Grand Turk Island, north of the Bahama Islands. The sub, which has successfully evaded the naval blockade, is found. A patrol aircraft is dispatched to follow the submarine, and then the USS Cecil picks up the trail. Changes in depth, radical course changes, but couldn't evade the Cecil. And got to the point where his batteries are low, his air supply is low, and had to surface in front of the Cecil. Surfacing in the presence of your enemy's forces is humiliating for a submarine captain. But when they surfaced, that was a, a profound defeat for their overall strategy uh, for Cuba, uh, making it clear that they could not contest the blockade. Because of its performance during the Cuban Missile Crisis, SOSIS and the concept of listening to sound underwater becomes a strategic imperative for the United States during the Cold War. The decision was made after the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1964 to radically extend the reach of SOSIS forward um, into areas like the uh, entrance to the North Atlantic from the Norwegian Sea, the entrance to the Norwegian Sea from the Barents Sea, arrays deployed way out in the Western Pacific oriented towards uh, Soviet submarine bases in the Far East. By, say, 1970, um, SOSIS was really deployed worldwide in almost all the ocean basins where there was a deep sound channel. At its peak in the 1970s, thousands of U.S. Navy technicians at 22 different secret facilities around the world processed ocean sound. SOSIS was a secret Cold War weapon of defense. And the Soviets never had the ability to build anything like it. Finding a single voice in a cityscape. Amazingly, our ears let us locate and focus on one person, one voice. No, 
now imagine finding a single sound in the ocean, not just hearing it, but knowing where it is thousands of miles away. How the U.S. found the wreckage of the USS Scorpion lost at sea on May 21, 1968, shows the power of underwater sound. In 1985, I led a secret mission for the Navy to study the wreckage of Scorpion. Sitting in about 11,000 feet of water, somewhere near the Azores Islands in the Atlantic. Why this nuclear sub sank with her crew of 99 is still a mystery. The most likely explanation is that one of its torpedoes was accidentally launched and destroyed the sub. To hear of um, any submarine disaster anywhere around the world, um, actually affects every submariner in whatever Navy. Those sailors in USS Scorpion, they'll always be remembered, but they've gone. And um, we take comfort, I think, not that we dwell on it, but I, I, we always look for the quick death. Evidence shows it was a quick death. Acoustic researchers heard its tragic demise from thousands of miles away. The Death Throes of Scorpion. This shows the sound of the explosion that tore a hole in Scorpion, and then less than a minute later, the sounds of the boat's walls collapsing in on itself. These hydrophone recordings, taken by Gordon Hamilton, helped the U.S. Navy find Scorpion. We've been running these recorders for almost 20 years. We had some unique signals that looked like they might be the implosion of a submarine. That analysis here showed that this signal was probably some sort of an explosion. There are three signals there, bing, bing, too close together and went a little bit farther apart. Two signals from what, based upon the frequency analysis, was probably from the hull collapse of the main, the main hull, various compartments of the main hull imploding. Using the principle of triangulation, Gordon Hamilton helped the Navy find Scorpion with three undersea sound recorders an ocean apart. One on the Canary Islands, one off Newfoundland, and one on Bermuda. Here's a diagram that shows how triangulation works. What we do is first of all measure the bearing from this first station, then we measure the bearing from the second station. And where they overlap, indicates the position of the submarine. If we're lucky, we may be able to receive at a third station as well, say over here. And of course, in an ideal world, the third position line should pass exactly through the fix determined from the first two, which is that point there. But in practice, we will get a triangle like that. Simple-mindedly, you would say that the submarine is somewhere in the middle of that triangle. Finding the USS Scorpion was simply a matter of science, but to some, it was much more. It was a miracle. It was a miracle, almost, almost impossible. The United States having fantastic high level of technology. Technologically, it was an incredible era for the United States. From about 1960 until about 1980, the U.S. submarine force, the U.S. Navy, um, just had a tremendous uh, uh, advantage based on a passive acoustic advantage over the Soviet submarine force. And U.S. subs running silent were probably 10 years ahead of the Soviets. Not that they weren't still a threat. Their subs, like ours, were carrying nuclear missiles. These behemoths defined the Cold War and they came to define Sosa's mission as well. Listening posts all over the world were tracking Soviet subs all over the oceans, sending information to Western aircraft, ships, and submarines on the hunt for Soviet subs like this. It was the golden age of Sosa's. That entire system was based on the foundation built by Sosa's. 
and things that came in from elsewhere were all assembled on that foundation. Uh, that became the, the linchpin. It became the mission of SOSIS to triangulate on Soviet submarines coming into the Atlantic or Pacific through geographic choke points like this one. When the Soviet ballistic missile submarines went through the area of such as uh, Greenland, uh, Iceland, uh, and the U United Kingdom through these barriers. Uh, usually uh, it was detected uh, by the very extensive social system in this area. U.S. subs picked up the chase, shadowing the Soviets' every move. The U.S. captain's orders, if war breaks out, kill the Soviet sub before it launches its missiles. SOSIS was the, the thing that opened the door to the U.S. Navy's capability to track, find, and detect, detect, and track Soviet submarines in deep water. Hundreds of missions probably took place, but only two have been declassified. One was the March 1978 mission of the USS Batfish. It all started with a message from SOSIS. The Soviet submarine entered the deep Norwegian Sea, and sounds, characteristic sounds from the Soviet submarine were picked up by the SOSIS arrays and transmitted to the station ashore in Iceland. We picked the Soviet submarine up on March 17th, all the way down to her patrol area off the east coast of the United States, where she was alert for three full weeks, ready to launch a nuclear strike against the United States, and then back up through a different path further to the east until she was just approaching the Barents Sea to return home, 50 days. One particular American admiral named Admiral Baggett uh, used to describe a Soviet submarine in that position was a tethered goat. Um, you know, this was a submarine had to stay in this rough area because of its mission, the range of its missiles, where its targets were. But we knew where the area was and we could find a submarine within it. And so, uh, was, you know, a tethered goat in an, in an area where there are foxes. The submarine that we were tracking did not know we were there and didn't for the entire patrol. Or did it? As presidents came and went, two things were clear. The Soviet enemy remained, and it had been busy. Under the waves, it seemed to know it was being spied on. They started seeing them behaving as though they knew somebody was looking or had become aware uh, that somebody else was in the room and stalking them. And some of us came to the conclusion that one good possibility was a breach in our own security. They knew more about us than we would be comfortable knowing that they knew. But the idea of somebody breaking our codes, the idea of somebody selling out our country, these things don't go down easily. But they were right. The judge said he didn't think your dad was genuinely remorseful. And he was probably right. And it spelled the beginning of the end of SOSIS. SOSIS played a critical role when the nuclear stakes were high. By laying out a line of defense in all directions like a tripwire, the United States and its allies gained a critical edge in the Cold War. But every story has another side, despite the fact that they had this listening system, despite the fact that they had the quietest submarines in the world, their system had a critical flaw. Its name was John Walker. Walker told the Soviets the U.S. could hear their submarines. He was compromising SOSIS probably by the time it was up and running. Walker began his espionage in either 66 or 67. What he had access to was all the classified material. It's inconceivable to me they didn't process many of the of the messages flowing out of the ocean surveillance system saying where all these Russian submarines were in any given day or any given hour. And then compare it back to the, to reality. That's the Rosetta Stone of understanding your enemy and then doing something about it. The Soviets did do something about it. They developed long range missiles and kept their submarines out of the Atlantic and the Pacific. The Soviet submarine force basically completely reoriented their posture in the 70s based on SOSA's end, what we could do with it. But they also had another strategy. 
In tipping off the Soviets to Sosis, Walker also tipped them off to their own noisy subs. Silas and submarines was a means against uh, the United States Sosis system. By 1978, the Soviets were launching submarines that Sosis was having trouble hearing. The only noise on this Soviet Victor III that Sosis could detect was the sound from the propeller, the same sound signature that the United States had to overcome 18 years before in creating its first quiet sub, Thresher. You know, we eliminate the signature in 1960 that we are just holding onto by a thread in 1980 against their most modern submarines. That thread is snapped clean by this. It is quiet, it is threatening, and it is undetectable. Akula, the shark. And when industrial giant Toshiba sells sophisticated propeller-making machinery to the Soviets in 1984, their submarine propellers become quiet to Sosis. In Washington, congressmen vent their frustration on a Toshiba radio. But it was John Walker's spine that probably set the stage for Akula. The Akula is frequently called the Walker class by U.S. Navy submariners because having studied all of this, they appreciate that Walker's espionage alerted the Russians in the 70s to a problem. And by the time we get to the 90s, the solution to the problem has arrived. They have built a much better submarine. Akula, with the help of Walker, trumped Sosis. So in effect, uh, they won that battle. They won that skirmish. They lost the war, but they won that particular skirmish. Historic tides may have just saved the U.S. and its allies. But some believe the Soviets spent themselves into bankruptcy trying to compete with the U.S. The cost of building a quiet submarine probably added to the Soviet Union's final fall. The world has changed, and so have the threats. After the Cold War, Sosis has been slowly taken offline. The remnants. There were once 22 facilities worldwide. Now there are three. But what is left is being used by this man, Chris Clark of Cornell University. He has been able to use Cold War technology for scientific research. He uses SOSIS not to track submarines, but whales. SOSIS is like a telescope. You're able to look into the deep ocean up as though it's into the night sky, and you see just these constellations of stars, and they all represent the voices of the whales. It's magical, because suddenly, instead of having only a few stars in the sky, suddenly now we have millions of stars in the sky. And it's just the beginning. It's this really the beginning that anyone has had to think of the ocean as the entire region in which we're imagining how many animals are there and what they're doing. We will look back upon this as an amazing period of time over 50 or 60 years where we instrumented an entire ocean basin to listen to it. 